Coming up on this week in computer hardware, can both AMD and Intel be gaining market share? Corsair's back in the air cooler game. Everybody's miffed at Ring, except Ring owners. Mold Roller Razor 2 updates and so much financial news. All that more coming up next on Twitch. This Week in Computer Hardware is brought to you from LastPass Studios. Using the same password everywhere is a security nightmare waiting to happen. LastPass easily creates unique passwords for every site. Visit lastpass.com slash twit. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This is Twitch, This Week in Computer Hardware, episode 551, recorded on January 30th, 2020. AMD cashes in, Intel cashes out. Welcome to Twitch, This Week in Computer Hardware, Twitch weekly show that aims to bring you all the hardware news, and oh my goodness, do we have a dog pile of it. Everybody talking about their financials this week, at least everybody, meaning Apple, Microsoft, AMD, and some others who we'll probably ignore, but some we won't, but right now... I need to introduce Mr. Sebastian Peek, audiobook consumer, much like myself. I am. And, uh, I'm guilty. Man I've about been listening to audiobooks for, I don't know, since <laughs> my Walkman, walking around with a Walkman, like the cool kid that I was, listening to audiobooks I checked out from the local library on cassette. Nice. So, and and chance, Old like school. all the way leading to present day where I walk around with a phone and, and a pair of wireless earbuds and listen to books. <laughs> I'm the person who I, never listens to music unless it's just always a book. I came to audiobooks incredibly late. Incredibly late. But I don't want to bring that up because my wife and I will probably start talking immediately in the middle of this show about the differences between listening to a book and reading a book with your eyes. And, and as uh, she will immediately, like, obviously her position is going to be, it's so much better to listen to it, isn't it? Right? That's exactly the opposite of her opinion on the subject. <laughs> oh, my goodness. We, we talk about shopping around. We talk about using tools like Camel, Camel, Camel or InStock to help you find the best deals on stuff. Um, I was I needed to I need to pick up an Android phone to do some testing of a new product. And uh, it is amazing. Not so much the high end, but in the, the mid price to low end Android phones, it is amazing how uh, I just want to say is how different uh, or how much phones can vary in price or features uh, like memory, depending on where you look. Because you know, I wanted to try to pick something up where I am. I had the option of like Verizon stores, Target, Best Buy, uh, and then Amazon, and it was crazy. Looking at like a three hundred dollar phone, um, you could find the same phone model, for example, from Motorola. I want to say. One version with 32 gigabytes, one version with 64 gigabytes, one version with like two or three gigabytes of memory, one version with four gigabytes of memory at the same price. Um, this is fascinating to me, right? So I just want to remind everybody, uh, we always tell you to shop around, check prices. Don't just look at Amazon, look at Newegg, look at other options. Um, beware some of the smaller options, maybe scams, especially as related to for sometimes uh, Amazon's sort of associates or some of the weird storefronts that pop up on uh, on uh, Google shopping searches, although that seems to be less of an issue these days. But I was just shocked. Oh, and also some of the deals on phones on Amazon.com are actually international phones that are gray market being sold in the U.S. without warranty, which could be problematic if they don't work. Although Amazon's been pretty good about supporting some of the scummier products that some of their, their associates have been uh, selling on there. But yeah, it's amazing. Uh, you know, tablets too, especially Android tablets. Uh, the difference between, uh, you know, roughly the same price for a one, two, or three gigabytes of memory on roughly the same processor on a ten-inch tablet for approximately the same price, depending on where you bought it, what channel you bought it in. So, keep an eye on the specs. Um, <laughs> shop around because the pricing is just ridiculous on a lot of these devices. So, I just I felt the need. To get that off my chest, Sebastian. Um, it's, it's also uh, not just like the the different. Well, we don't have to get into this, but just <laughs> when I just search Android, oh, I asked phone, you <laughs> Amazon. There are over four thousand results immediately, right? And if just looking at phones, I I feel like I am getting older because I think about the days when, if you were looking at phones, there were just a few 
phones. You could get an iPhone because there was only one. You picked which capacity right. you could afford. And then on the Android side, there were a few flagship phones. We're talking like 2009, 2010, right. when people had their own smartphone families, but it would kind of – the Android thing really didn't happen until I think it was late 2008. And then into 2009, you had more and more phones showing up. But if you wanted a high-end phone, there were just a few – and it wasn't too right. long after this that the market became just like filled with phones from the major players like Samsung and LG and uh, HTC. Any anybody I'm forgetting? ZTE, Motorola, Blue, yeah, Motorola, ZTE, yeah. Huawei. And then by 2000, I don't think we really had Huawei here in 2010. I wasn't aware of it back then. By 2012 the Windows Phone thing was kind of taking off, where they were spending a lot of money on marketing and they were really emphasizing the camera quality. And I switched. I, I left. I had left Apple to go to Android and then I left Android to go to Windows Phone and I bought a Lumia 920. And so I was on that for a while. I switched around different and uh, Win Lumia phones at the time. But uh, it's just... Now you look at it, and of course, Windows Phone is pretty much gone. But just the sheer volume of Android phones that are so close to each other. I, I got to the point where it's so overwhelming, all I do is I just look at a particular price point. I just pick a price. And then within that price, try to find right. one that I think is going to have the least offensive skin on it. How close to stock mm -hmm. Android is it going to be? And that's when I'd make my picks. So for the longest time, I was a straight-up Motorola consumer for any phone two hundred dollars or less we'll just buy the g whatever because they do a very light skin if any and but of course that's kind of gone because of, as of what like 2014 when google briefly owned motorola so there was a time yes, when the several Motorola minutes. phones, <laughs> yeah the moto e and the moto g those were stock android devices with a, maybe a moto app on it but right. that doesn't exist anymore they're mostly so, stock yeah, yeah, it's, that's kind of different. Yeah, I think that's something that changed with maybe Android seven or eight. It just you stopped seeing the really, really heavy handed. Well, it skins, changed with you know? Lenovo buying Motorola, and I don't think the skins are heavy handed compared to say Samsung. But then again, I've always found Samsung skins to be incredibly frustrating, um, and it's amazing how much bad firmware. Reaching back to last week's episode, can screw up the experience on an otherwise great product. Um, shifting gears. And to much bigger numbers, uh, so much finance news this week. Uh, AMD in particular, $2.13 billion in Q4 revenue. Uh, that's, of course, due to Ryzen and Radeon. Uh, Venture, Beak, uh, Venture Beat, not Venture Beak, although I do like the idea of a tech <laughs> website called Venture Beak. Uh, Venture Beat says the in uh, x86, oh my goodness, <laughs> for the latest in Beak technology. I'll stop now. Um, so AMD... Uh, they're saying AMD is an 18% share, up 5 percentage points. Uh, x86 notebook chips, 14.7% for AMD, up 3.8 percentage points. And x86 client, AMD had 15.8% of the market, up from 4.2 percentage points. Um, what's interesting about that is, A, those are you know single-digit but pretty huge gains in terms of AMD because fundamentally the rest of the market is, is in most cases – entirely intel uh ironically intel ceo also claimed it was growing uh in market share last week or reducing its losses um and as venture uh, Beat, yeah uh, intel points did out, <laughs> pretty well that's the thing it's we saw all this the growth from amd yeah. and all the excitement about amd and ryzen which has been you know it's been three years now growing that side of the business yeah. and kind of becoming relevant in the pc desktop space where they haven't been in many years but the Intel call, they they, may, they brought in $20.2 billion in revenue. So they're doing yes. okay. And of course, wasn't like trying to suggest they weren't. Yeah, <laughs> it's just funny because, and, and even on the server side, we're like, well, there's no way they're gaining there. And apparently, and I, don't, I didn't see the actual name of the company being disclosed, but somebody had a major purchase go through uh -huh. just in time for them to be able to show this big gain for the last quarter. So they sold a whole bunch of server servers or server processors to somebody. And that was something that was like a deal that was in the works since earlier in 2019. So well, they're, they're still I, one of the okay. things, 
Yeah, I mean, Dean Takahashi points out in his article on Venture Beats. Uh, first of all, he points out the last time I checked, both companies can't be gaining share in a two company market, uh, but AMD has been gaining market share for the last eight quarters. Uh, again, as we've mentioned, with the announcement of the new laptop processors or mobile processors coming from AMD, it's going to be a very exciting year for Intel, who uh, has a lot of money and a lot of contracts uh, with which to fight AMD with. Uh, yeah. Other news, Apple and Broadcom have been uh, told to pay $1.1 billion in damages for infringing California Institute of Technology patents on various and sundry Wi-Fi technologies. Uh, that was a jury decision in California. 838 billion of, the, or 838 million of that 1.1 billion would be coming uh, from Apple. Uh, Apple and Broadcom, of course, plan to appeal and pretty much say that this is ridiculous and we didn't do anything wrong and and they totally interpreted everything and we're innocent and we don't owe anybody money, uh, which is essentially you know these this will argue back and forth to the highest court or reduce to bounce. Um, you know that said, Apple shouldn't have any problems paying 838 billion million 838 million dollars um, because in their Q1 aka the holiday shopping season the first quarter of the year for Apple they dropped 91.8 billion in sales they averaged a smidge over a billion or approximately a billion dollars in sales a day 56 billion of that was iPhones most of that iPhone 11 uh, we're talking about profits of 22.2 billion so maybe just maybe if it's possible that they infringed on some patents from the university that came up with the technology they could cut them a check you know they probably only have 170 billion squirreled away uh, at this point um, iPhone 11 sales were huge uh, this holiday season if you have one uh, 95 Mac has a great write-up on how to turn off ultra wideband u1 chip to prevent background location tracking on iPhone 11 and 11 pro actual name of the article obviously thinking of Google in that one uh, which essentially involves going into OS 13.3.1 to hit a switch to turn off the u1 chip which uses uh, other devices in a room to help give fairly precise locations and uh, for the device, when you do that, uh, your iPhone will no longer use location services to enhance Wi-Fi and Bluetooth connections, which may or may not be a problem. I tend to notice that uh, it's actually a good thing when I turn that stuff off. Uh, Apple says it tracks that info because the hyper-accurate tracking isn't legal in some countries, and they need to be able to turn it off in the countries it's not legal in. Uh, it's funny also, because the iPhone 11 popularizing, uh, popularizing yeah. the ultra-wide <laughs> angle camera which, you know, it's the iPhone 11 hits and it's got a wide angle and an ultra wide angle. And then in the settings, there's this ultra wide something or other that you could easily just skim past and think, oh, I need that chip for my like ultra wide photos. Right. And in reality, it's just using it to locate as accurately as it can, even if you're indoors using other wireless devices. Yeah. That's interesting. Well, I was laughing like uh, the essentially what that is for in the iPhone 11 is to enhance uh, airdrop. Um, which is the ad hoc file transfer which system? Everyone uses Patrick. How that many was times my question. Do you use AirDrop? I've never used it, but email twitch at twit.tv if you actually have used, or even more shocking to Sebastian and I, regularly use AirDrop. We're I've curious used it. If once. anyone uses I've used it. it once, I took a bunch of pictures <laughs> and I thought, wait, what's the best way to get these pictures into Lightroom? Do I really need to sync up my phone? Or can I email them? That's kind of annoying because there's so many of them. Let's use AirDrop because I have a Mac. So I make sure that it's set up. And I'm like, wait, no, it isn't set up. So, like, okay, log into iCloud on this Mac. All right, I haven't done that yet because I just kind of use it as a basic computer. I don't use any of the iCloud stuff. Get that set up. Right. Authorize everything. Yes, trust this device, blah, blah, blah. And then once I finally had it all set up and opened up the application again, then I had that option when you click on like the share button. And one of the things was like AirDrop. And yeah, they sent them right over the Wi-Fi network. It was great, and I never used it again. So, if you go, if you actually have it set up, it is a slightly faster and less cumbersome way to get files like pictures off of your phone and onto your Mac. There you have it. Mm -hmm. um, everybody sitting in the front row watching the show right now, you'll notice that we have uh, put down uh, so some plastic sheeting you can pull up to protect yourself from the frothing that Sebastian is about to emit. Um, uh -oh. Caviar. Is this, a Gallagher, is this a Gallagher show now? What's happening? This is a, this is a Gallagher reference. Have you seen uh, Caviar's design for the cyber phones, sir? 
No. It's a customized yes. iPhone yeah. 11 Pro, a.k.a. the Cyberphone. A lot of titanium mm -hmm. in there. Mm -hmm. Price is only available on request. <laughs> Back cover signs, to ask, even the screen, Caviar this. writes, are hidden under mental plates. This is the company that makes like $100,000 bedazzled, I mean um, bejeweled cell phones, primarily, I think, for the rich Saudi market uh, or, you know, the ultra-rich delete expletives on uh, Instagram. Um, they claim this was uh, the design of the – well, I'll read this. The design of the body is inspired by the geometry of a Tesla Cybertruck. At the same time, it is improved aesthetically. Accurate lines are explained not only by the functionality but also create a visual component nice to look at. Um, first of all, I think well, they get somebody nice to Nice to look English. at? They were going nice so to look well at. there and then like, we made it nice right to look cliff. at. <laughs> yeah, exactly. They were, you were really on a roll there, guys. Now, when I saw the name so close. Caviar, uh, yes. I was impressed. And I really think that, and you maybe you thought I was going to froth at the mouth complaining about this, but <laughs> I find it upsetting when really, really, really wealthy people don't have a very obvious and ostentatious way to display their wealth to people and the fact that <laughs> iPhones are now so commonly available. There was a time when it was a status symbol to have an iPhone. In 2007, in that summer when they came out, you walked around with your iPhone. No case, of course, because how else is anybody going to know it's an iPhone that you paid five to $600 for, plus a two-year contract commitment with Singular, a.k.a. AT&T back then. But, you know, just having that iPhone, like, yeah, look at me. I'm wealthy enough to have an iPhone. It meant something. And now... The peasants now out there in the world have smartphones, <laughs> right? That's that's sad. So for them, it's like, yeah, I, I could raise up my iPhone, and every you know, fourteen year old and up in America has some form of smartphone now. Apparently, uh, it doesn't Personally, mean anything. I, I, see, I want to get the 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 Credo Red Dragon, the fifty two hundred dollar uh, iPhone eleven Pro with the custom titanium back with dragon on it. Just so I can get the presentation box that comes with it. These are, uh, I, you know, if it's your thing, it's good to know that you can get your meteor. Oh, there's a meteorite one. Hold on. I okay. Here we I, go. I, I, I get the Discovery the, like, Terra. <laughs> the gross eleven thousand nine hundred twenty dollars. Like, the just completely unnecessary <laughs> expense of something to say that is expensive. Do you remember that app that was just an app of, that was like a picture of a ruby or something, and it was five thousand dollars in the app yeah. store. And it was yes. just to say, like, you know, actually, a few people actually apparently bought it. Just, hey, look, I have the most expensive app in the world as a status thing. Which does nothing. But yeah, It does absolutely nothing except prove that you spent that much money on it. Here, the I have I've... an issue because it this does not look like a Cybertruck to me. And and how presumptuous so of them to say that they improved on the Cybertruck. The Cybertruck is perfection. A Maybe vehicle, they thought they were improving on the vehicle. iPhone 11. Hey, mm -hmm. Kevin, if you can see the link I just put in there, uh, see if you can get the the uh, Discovery Terra to come up, which is uh, a turbulent watch. Is it even watch. worse? Is it even it's, worse? It's, it is what my uncle used to call beyond taste. Mm. Um, it's kind of spectacular. It's the it sounds like a brand. Oh, sorry. Actually, my mouse, my mouse was on a completely different page, I swear. There you go. That's the one. The Discovery Terra. This is just awe-inspiring. Click on it until you get the one that kind of fills the screen. Hey, can I can That's I add one, one little thing about the Cyberphone? You, you if can. It's, <laughs> if it's based on the Cybertruck design, does that mean it also has the world's easiest to smash glass for the screen? Oh, it's in their yeah. trailer? So they're just trying well, to own honest. that moment? That's ridiculous. Elon Musk hey. walking around looking pensively at <laughs> the glass. <laughs> That's the not two, the way that was supposed to one, work. but two broken windows. Oh, guys, yeah, we planned somebody... it. That was just a gag just to loosen everybody up. We're not really using yeah. 1940s uh, glass, jam jar glass <laughs> for the windows. You know, if they were putting it together at the last minute, it may have well have been untempered yeah, glass. Like, oh, but crap, I assure you, this glass. if it's going to be sold in the United States, it will have tempered safety glass when they're done with it. Oh, uh, I also should point out that if you're looking for um, AirPods Pro with a premium alligator leather enclosure on the case, uh, mm. then Caviar is your website. Wait, they have that a mere $1,600. Yeah. So they, so they list the price on that. 
price on request for this cyber phone to me says one can only imagine. I'm kind of disappointed I couldn't get the phone made out of Meteor. But the ones with the high-end watches integrated in them is just fascinating. Um, shifting gears again, uh, Xbox revenue down 21%. Big shock, of course. The Xbox Series X or 10, depending on how uh, how you feel about the letter X, is going to be going on sale. Holiday 2020. And uh, so slowing down, and that's uh, not surprising. What also is not surprising is Nintendo's Switch is crushing everything. 52 million units sold, 10 million over the holiday shopping season. Actually, nearly 11 million units sold over the holidays. Um, this is Nintendo's third best-selling home console after the Wii and the NES. Uh, the, the Super Nintendo Entertainment System is now in fourth place. And uh, there's an interesting uh, chain of tweets by uh, Daniel Ahmad who basically points out it only took the Switch 34 months to get the kind of numbers that the Xbox One took 74 months to get to. I feel, uh, he says to the group, that the Switch is going to continue to just just go huge. Um, it's, it's crazy. The, when you look at the numbers... It's the mainstream he, darling console, for sure. Because it, it seems to transcend what you would expect. The, right. It's kind of like the Wii. Like The Wii was the thing that was the paradigm shift in game consoles where it went from this gamer and people who got into games being of a certain age or whatever the demographics were to everybody plays Wii games uh everybody from you know the typical 18 to 34 or 35 up through retirement age young children 95 year olds everybody played the Wii and then Nintendo's brand kind of was tarnished by the Wii U because it was this confusing successor that a lot of people and I worked in retail at the time, a lot of people thought the Wii U right. was an accessory for the Wii and did not understand it was a new console and did not understand why the new Wii U games didn't work in their Wii and they tried to return them after they'd been open. So the that went away. They should have brought out a new console sooner honestly because there was an entire right. Christmas where we didn't have anything to sell from Nintendo. But when the Switch came out, that this hurt took a while to get started. I think their services in, when they finally kicked in with their like $20 a year online membership right. thing that provides you with access to all these classic games, there's a big market for retro stuff now compared to what it was you know, 10 or 20 years ago. And to say, hey, you subscribe to this for 20 bucks a year, which is nothing when everybody's paying $10 a month for everything. You know, you've got your Hulu right. subscription, Netflix, Disney Plus, CBS All Access, whatever you're subscribing to. You've got like 5 to $10 a month things coming out right and left on your credit card anyway. What's $20 a year to Nintendo? And you get access to all these classic games you remember from when you were a kid. So it plays on people's nostalgia and... Oh, by the way, it's this platform for all these new games that are coming out. And of course, it's got the Disney license, Disney, the Nintendo, basically the Disney of the video game world with their licensed properties. So Mario, Zelda, that's all you need. Uh, you know, think about it. The Switch, which is really just a repurposed uh, NVIDIA tablet, like the Shield tablet. Right. With controllers stuck to the sides of it. And then, and of course, NVIDIA's only win in the console space, which is, you know, it's nice for them that it's selling better because AMD dominates with the PlayStation and the Xbox. And it was a big move for Nintendo because they had stuck with AMD after going ATI graphics with the GameCube. They stuck with ATI graphics with the Wii. Then they stuck with AMD ATI graphics with the Wii U. And then with the Switch, the rumors were all about how it was going to be some AMD APU and it's going to be like a portable version of one of the big consoles. And right. there was even like the talk, like the rumors about the big pro the bigger prototype, the thing that kind of maybe evolved into the the handheld console that Dell was showing at CES this year. But the Switch, I think I have a point here. I'm trying to remember what it was. <laughs> the, the, blah, blah, blah. The Switch repurposing a Nexus, or, or not a Nexus, a, uh, a Shield tablet, which is funny because the Amazon Fire was a, was literally a resold uh, BlackBerry Playbook, the original right. Amazon Kindle Fire. 
I have no idea where I'm going with this. So, uh, Patrick, I think what you're trying to say is it's a shockingly successful product based on what looks like some relatively inexpensive off the shelf components from NVIDIA that has allowed uh, Nintendo to take its beloved intellectual property, apply it to a new platform that people actually like because it's portable, it works well at home, and it's not, you know, sort of emotionally trying. To deal with because at some point the Wii was so hard about we're for people who don't like video games. Yeah, people who yeah. like video games stopped buying it. Uh, that was I far more eloquent slightly. than anything I was saying. And I like well, give me some time to formulate a <laughs> yeah. another version. I had of it. time. Um, I had time. Listeners don't know this, but Patrick's uh, Skype, uh, you know, threw up and he had to restart real quick. So I was just babbling on and on. Well, and I, didn't have to I had all Skype sorts of time to come up with a, a point, <laughs> and I still did not. My mind just went to a blank, as it often does. Well, I don't know. Switching the gears. The switch is uh, for people spot. who like to play games, Patrick. Yes. They just, they just like it. They don't, they don't care about the best graphics. The graphics are fine. They're good enough. Yeah. You don't need a PS4 well, that's... Pro to play video games. I mean, one of the things we were again reaching back to last week, we were talking about how frustrating it is when when a lot of PC games ship where they're not really finished. And sometimes, you know, that was a really big problem when there was still physical discs in a box. It's less of a problem now that you know video games basically all come from Steam, um, except the ones that don't. But there's still moments when you're like, yeah, this would work great if my GPU was updated, or if this feature finished, or if it didn't crash, or if it. Um, and the funny thing about I've never heard somebody fire up a new, and maybe I just haven't talked to the right people or all of my friends spend too much time playing Zelda, but I've never heard anyone talk about a, a, a game on the Switch and being like, yeah, I had to wait for like the third patch for it to really run properly because it was really frustrating. It's like, it's nice when you download it, you run it, and it just delete expletive works. Um, speaking of working and deleting expletives and stuff that kind of came out of the blue as far as I'm concerned. Uh, FCC announcement this week. Wireless Telecommunications Bureau and Office of Engineering and Technology approved four spectrum access system administrators for full-scale commercial deployment in the 3.5 gigahertz band and emphasized licensee compliance obligations to the 3650 to 3700 megahertz band under Part 96. Calm um, down. Calm down. That was a, that was just the title of this marvelous document from the FCC. But but basically, think better 4G now, better 5G later. Uh, 3.5 gigahertz spectrum, uh, mid-band spectrum. Uh, it's already being used for 5G in China and Europe and South Korea. Um, this is the biggest step, the the huge step for the Citizens Broadband Radio Service, a.k.a. CBRS. Uh, and what they're trying to do is bring the marketing term for a bunch of technology known as on-go to market, uh, which opens up some general authorized uh, access tier in 3.5 gigahertz to be uh, essentially free, open, public spectrum that the carriers can use to augment phone performance. Now, you may be like, but wait, this spectrum was reserved for the Navy, for radar. Well, they've got a deal where if the, the Navy needs it, uh, you know, it'll kind of be rerouted. <laughs> your 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 needs will be rerouted to other parts <laughs> of the spectrum, which is part of what OnGo does. Um, it is, it's actually kind of fascinating to me. Um, there's a, you know, because I started digging into the the CBRS Alliance, uh, you know, their press release alone um, seems just massively dense to me. And their their website yeah. does a lot of work in keeping you as far away from the actual technological information uh, as they can and into the marketing fluff, you know. Because um, I, I, the announcement from CBRS is that, remember that FCC announcement that was like 92 minutes long, the title? Um, FCC authorizes full commercial deployment of on-go service in 3.5 gigahertz CBRS band, unleashing billions in value with new wireless services. Industry it sounds like a research celebrate. paper title. Like, it and then I does. would expect all the doctors down below it listed. Yeah. Um, essentially, though, what it means is they have technology that will allow Android and uh, Apple phones to use 3.5 gigahertz bandwidth. Um, which is normally currently kind of used by the Department of Defense. Um, and uh, But this is, I'm really curious to see um, what happens, you know, uh, and how long it takes for it to happen. But essentially, this is all part of, you know, the FCC and Ajit Pai's 5G fast plan. Not that anyone seems to need 5G or it seems to be working the way everybody expected it to. Um, Hashtag to better 4G. Let's just have better 4G everywhere. <laughs> Let's have 4G, 4G that that's less. actually like LTE and yeah. not enhanced backhaul 3G stuff from 2012. 
12. Well, part of what was, was interesting about this for me is is the Google Pixel 4, Motorola's 5G Moto Mod, the Galaxy S10, the iPhone 11. Uh, should anyone have actually bought one, LG's G8 Think, uh, and the OnePlus 7 Pro, um, apparently are all on-go compatible. Hmm. So I'm curious to see, you know, when that stuff is going to roll out and if we're going to see any performance improvements. So... I don't know. I you know I just had no idea this was coming, and now it's here. So I'm all excited. I'm verklempt. <laughs> What's well, up don't with get cash out? Too verklempt. Yeah, I was gonna say before you get too verb whatever that Yiddish out. word was. <laughs> yeah, just because this is really dense too. We sh- maybe shouldn't have put these back to back, but you know if you're already in that <laughs> mode where you've kind of glazed over like I did. Now, prepare yourself, because while there is a really cool title, like the name of this is Cash Out, and that's trendy, you know, Cash Out Attack. CashOutAttack.com oh, yeah. is the website for the researchers who put this up from University of Michigan and I believe Adelaide, mm-hmm. University of Adelaide. So Cash Out, according to Intel, who this was all like they worked behind the scenes with Intel on this, they didn't just announce it to the world they told intel about it so that intel could implement microcode fixes for this and then they announced this on this was on monday right so uh what intel describes this as and of course you know if you're keeping track at home this is cve hyphen 2020 hyphen 0549 side channel variant uh uh it's l1d eviction sampling duh uh, and L1D, for those of you who don't know, is level one uh, data cache, just so you know. Mm-hmm. So, quote, on some processors under certain microarchitectural conditions, data from the most recently evicted modifier L1 data cache line may be propagated into an unused, invalid L1D <laughs> fill buffer. On processors affected by microarchitectural data sampling or transactional asynchronous abort data from an L1D fill buffer may be inferred using one of these data sampling side channel methods. By combining these two behaviors together, it may be possible for a malicious actor to infer data values for modified cache lines that were previously evicted from the L1 data cache. This is called L1D eviction sampling. Now, remember that, okay, because it's going to be important for the rest of this dense uh, article that I linked to, but yeah, cash out. So all you really need to know is this is Word. basically the same <laughs> speculative execution flaw that we've been hearing about for a long time now. Spectre, Meltdown, uh, Zombie Load, now cash out. They're just finding more ways in these controlled environments, the tests that they've come up with, the way that they've been able to exploit this. This one is concerning, though, because even though Intel swears this is something that they really could only happen in a controlled environment like what U of M and the University of Adelaide did in researching this, the problem here is they say that they empirically demonstrated, quote, that cash out can violate nearly every hardware-based security domain leaking data from the OS kernel, co-resident virtual machines, and even SGX enclaves, end quote. So this sounds pretty serious. Uh, Intel is trying to downplay this. It's only been given a severity rating of 6.5 on the severity rating scale, which I, you know, I guess I vaguely knew it existed. It's almost like the, like, national, uh, you know, terrorism alert scale because it's color coded so you have to remember uh low i think is black it's either black or dark blue and then you have medium which is yellow high is orange and critical is a really dark crimson color which is very easy to remember so we're just in that medium alert phase right now it hasn't gone to orange yet so don't turn off hyper threading and to, actually, you know what? Don't go into your don't go into your AMI BIOS from 1991 and scroll through those blue menus with white text to find the uh, m- what is it motherboard like uh, the features page, like the uh, platform features page, and turn off processor internal cache because that might affect your performance just a bit. Uh, a smidge. 
Yeah, just a smidge. Because it's funny, like if if you we kind of talked about this back when probably when Alan was still doing the show or back when Ryan was doing the show, because these have been going on for that long. And kind of the thing about modern processors is while it may seem hilarious to talk about a 386 or a 486 processor, let's talk about what happened from the 486 era into the Pentium era. Pentium processors, uh, AMD would have been happy to tell you back then, you know, a Pentium is really just two 486s, right? Because this right. superscalar structure, like the, the dual pipelines of a Pentium were essentially just two 486 pipelines. And... They had MMX. They added MMX uh, later as they continued to battle with AMD and they went back and forth. <laughs> and, you know, when we move up to the modern era, a lot of the performance improvements come because mm -hmm. of branch prediction and come because of cash. You know, onboard right. cash has increased considerably over the years. And if you take away cash, and you take away branch prediction and you just are, you know, doing all the math every single time all over again, every time you've got to crunch numbers and process something, it's right. not a whole heck of a lot faster than it was in 1991. So right, right. this is it's a really big deal when stuff like this comes out and there are questions about should I have this feature enabled? Will microcode take away this? How much? latency is this going to add how much performance impact is this going to have so it's a big deal and it's annoying for somebody like me because if you're a conscientious tech reviewer you always want to have the most current and valid numbers on any chart and there have been a number of microcode i was i was on a z390 motherboard doing some updated <laughs> testing on a 9900ks last week right actually at the beginning of this week and I had just I did it because I had just applied the newest microcode update from I think the 20th of January available for this motherboard and this was before the cash out news hit so it was actually that was last week so it was only 10 days ago already we have this new information coming out on the 27th <laughs> 7 days after this motherboard vendor released the latest microcode updates there's another one or maybe it's the same one. Maybe that was released in advance. That would be fantastic if I find that out and I can keep those <laughs> results. But otherwise, i got to throw those out and benchmark everything all over again. But that's the world we yeah. live in today. Mitigations, which almost always <laughs> means tiny performance decrease. It's basically nothing. It's like 2%. Okay, well, 2%, 1.5%, 2%. 3%, it all adds up because it's not like the mitigation for the one issue and the mitigation for the other issue cancel each other out. So, And then, of course, there's Microsoft side of things because they've been given this information too. So there's going to be OS-level patches. And I can't imagine anything that's patching an OS to mitigate the potential for this kind of exploit is going to make the kernel faster and more efficient than it was before. So I, I, I'll have to listen then to security now if, if Steve hasn't already talked about this to find out more about cash out. Because I, I kind of, it, when it gets this dense and if you yeah. tuned out already, I kind of, I understand. Because when I was reading Intel's quote <laughs> about this, I haven't even read the research paper yet. If you go to cashoutattack.com, these researchers who were very, very proud of their initial discovery of this and their, their um, analysis of this. They have their paper up there. You can click on it. And it is 16 pages of just dense, dense reading. You, you will learn more about sampling reads and writes. And, you know, let's see what else is in here. Cross-thread reads and writes and same-thread reads and writes and victim load stores. It, it's Far beyond me. I'm an enthusiast hardware person, and I, I run benchmarks, and I play with new graphics cards and stuff when they come out. But uh, I'm not a scientist, uh, and this is definitely <laughs> something that would be right up your alley if you were a true computer scientist. So, yes, oh I'm a fraud. Oh, uh, wow. You know, that was just heartening. <laughs> 
it just keeps coming. I guess what I should have I should have just glossed over it, said read it if you're interested, and moved on to the next story. But this is constant. This is we've been like the L one D stuff, like the the um this particular exploit, the uh what is it called? Branch prediction, not branch prediction, but this family of exploits, the well, this is they're talking about cash eviction, which is beyond me. But the speculative speculative execution threats are a big deal. And they had us talking very seriously last year about disabling hyper threading on processors. And it's kind of funny because to answer the competition, Intel is apparently increasing the the number of products in their product stack that include hyper threading because they don't have the core counts to compete with with AMD right now. So they don't have desktop processors with 16 cores. You have to go to the high end desktop family, which is a different family to get up to the 18 core processor, which is the 10980XE we talked about in November. And that's a thousand dollar processor. So on the AMD side, they have a 16 core processor for 750. They've got a 12 core processor for 500. And they have a bunch of eight core processors and six core processors that all have hyper threading or their version of it because hyper threading is a trade name. It's symmetrical multiprocessing or SMT, symmetrical multi-threading. But we're talking six cores, 12 threads on a $200 processor from AMD. So what is Intel going to do? They're going to add a hyper threading to Core i5. So you're going to have six core, 12 thread Core i5 parts to compete with the six core, 12 thread AMD part at 199 that's what the market's going to look like this year. And if more and more of these come out, or if there's more and more concern about speculative execution and branch prediction and how safe is hyper-threading again, you know, I think for most home users, especially if you're running a patched OS, you're fine. But it's still, <laughs> it's obviously not great for them. And anything that affects their performance, even if it's single-digit percentage points, is not helping them fight AMD either. Well, thank you again, ladies and gentlemen, for being a listener to This Week in Computer Hardware, where we occasionally get depressed and bring the depression to you when we talk about hardware. But mostly we get excited, and sometimes we get critical, and mostly we just try to bring you the most useful, engaging, and valuable information we can about what's going on in desktops and mobile and hardware and laptops. But seriously, thank you for listening to the show. If you haven't subscribed, please subscribe. And if you want to know more about what's going on in tech beyond our rather narrow and geeky view of hardware, you should probably take a, a, a moment, take a look at Twitch show Hands on Tech, where the hosts unbox and review everything hot off the press or straight from the factory. Leo Laporte, Jason Howe, Aunt Pruitt, and other Twit friends give you the sneak peek of all the hottest tech gadgets, whether it be tablets, phones, cameras, or wearables. You know Leo is. He wants to see the new thing. He wants to see it now. He orders it. It gets there, and they tear into it. You don't want to miss out on their expert feedback before your next smart tech purchase. Subscribe to Hands on Tech on your favorite podcatcher or visit twit.tv slash H-O-T. It's good stuff there. It really is. Oh, my goodness. Hey, we were talking a lot about Sonos and some of the frustrations of longstanding hardware that still functions. Um you know, basically where a company goes, we're going to give you a support for life. And then they realize that maybe the technology or maybe the bottom line or owner structure has changed in a way that prevents them from continuing to code things up to update your aging hardware. Um, but, you know, one of the things that wasn't as clear and certainly not emphasized in a lot of the articles we were looking at last week, uh, and as both Sebastian and I dug deeper and deeper into Sonos's website, um, this Sonos kind of buried a really important line in this announcement, which was that, quote, customers with both legacy and modern products have time to decide what option is best for them. You can continue to use your whole system in legacy mode. In this case, it will stop receiving updates and new features. Um, or, uh, you know, you know, they basically said that, you know, they're, they're going to let you run your older gear on its own kind of node, isolated, so you can keep getting updates on the newer stuff. If you mix the newer and the older stuff, the legacy hardware, as they call it, um, you are not going to get updates to the newer stuff. And, and, you know, I will also say that we saw this crazy uh, – it wasn't crazy. Sebastian and I were also admiring the intensity of the letter that came out, so the blog entry from the oh, yeah. CEO of Sonos, 
uh, which well, you, was probably you heard half you, inspired by the drop in stock price or half inspired <laughs> by everybody on the Internet uh, and it, it, Sonos' own forums going berserk. You know, but it's it's blog. A letter from our CEO. All Sonos products will continue to work past May. Rest assured that come May when we end new software updates for our legacy products, they will continue to work as they do today. We are not breaking them. We are not forcing them into obsolescence. And we are not taking anything away. Many of you have invested heavily in your Sonos systems. We intend to honor that investment for as long as possible. While legacy Sonos products won't get new software features, we pledge to keep them updated with bug fixes and security patches for as long as possible. They say long as possible. A lot. Yes. Um, it's confidence so, you know, inspiring. So what they say, though, is, is, is they are working on a way to split your system, quote, so that modern products work together and get the latest features while legacy products work together and remain in their current state, i.e., if you have 11 of these devices in your house and seven of them are, quote, legacy, unquote, you won't have to replace all of them if you just want to listen to some delete expletive music. Delete expletive being another one of the words of the week here on the show. Um, I don't know. It's... Uh, it was it was interesting because that led to an article by uh, Jean Louis Gasset, uh, the Frenchman of Apple fame, um, who basically wrote a really interesting observation. You know, where he talks about how frustrating Sonos has kind of brought into light um, how problematic the Internet of Things of of, of has has gotten. And he, and he points out, he's like, I love this line. It was one thing to find a cranky operating system or application on one's laptop. It created a culture of folklore. Managing the dozens of devices in a smart home is a set of tasks for which we are ill-prepared. It's not more of the same. He also adds, nor are we prepared for what happens to our privacy when the IoT devices that share information about our activities become required by market forces or worse, mandated by new laws and regulations. Imagine what marketers and government agencies or government agencies could do with such information. There is no could. It will happen. There's too much stored value in these network of connected devices. The appetites will be too strong, as we've discovered with Nest devices, as we've discovered with Ring, which we'll talk about later on. Uh, you know, can televisions, televisions routinely sell the data they collect about your viewing habits. It's a revenue stream for an industry that has incredibly small margins. Uh, and this isn't even getting to the, the fact that we've seen so many inexpensive Internet of Things devices or Internet of uh, Stuff, except not stuff, if you want to read a great, uh, follow a great Twitter feed, um, where we've simply seen products that kind of go straight from the factory with the sort of, well, we put together this app to prove that our widget works and then straight into the market, maybe with some changes of the graphics on the widget, but no actual testing or legitimate uh, uh, security uh, testing. And it's it's getting messier. I mean, it's one of the reasons I have very few IoT things in my house. I will probably never have a wireless locking system in my house because I, I hang out with too many people that do security testing for a living. And it seems like every wireless technology eventually gets cracked. Am I paranoid? Probably. Is it a legitimate concern? Probably. Is it creepy to realize that, you know, uh, devices in your house are listening to you? Yes. Um, but uh, I don't know. We'll see. We'll see what happens over time. Um, but, uh, you know, it's – it's if you're dealing with a large network um, – and a lot of IoT devices, it can get really messy. And that's in the, it, it's, it's nice to see someone pointing this out other than Sebastian and I being frustrated. <laughs> <laughs> when you say we'll testing. see, it, just, it seems too parental, Patrick. That's just can – can we have – we'll see. We'll see. We'll see. It's a step we above wait. Ask Your Mother, at least. <laughs> it is a step above Ask Your Mother. Turning things to something simpler and less dramatic or potentially emotionally, physically, or financially, or legally threatening, let us move on to Corsair's, I'm going to call it re-entry into the air-cooled yeah. market. Uh, the A500 dual fan CPU, uh, you did the review on this one. It is a big, happy black box of fans and cooling joy. It's How did big. it hold up in your testing? It's heavy. Yeah, it looks big. Oh, <laughs> without looking at the specs. How heavy would you right. assume this to be? 3.8 pounds. I'm going to go oh, high. Okay. You, you went high. It's 3.2 pounds. 3.2 <laughs> pounds. I thought I was a lot it's higher CPU than that. Cooler. Is it a this solid is, block of copper? No, no, no. It uses four copper heat pipes. Okay, at its base, literally, uh, right. the bottom of this cooler is direct contact heat pipes, which you're 
probably very familiar with if you've ever bought or used a course uh, the cooler master hyper 212 evo which uses sure. four direct contact heat pipes on the bottom of it so this is the same thing it looks a lot nicer it's more like the the polished black edition look from course from cooler master but corsair this is their own product they they have in the past had their air series which was the a they had the a50 which uh, Josh on our staff still uses all these years later. And the A70 was the the bigger, better one. And then they were just gone. From 2010 when the A70 was launched right. until 2020 at CES when they launched this A500, they had no air coolers. It was all liquid cooling. Corsair has become synonymous with liquid, liquid cooling in this industry with their all-in-one coolers like the H100, the legendary H100, and all of its uh, successors. But this thing, I have it right here, it's just a big, heavy air cooler. And it's it's like a big single block instead of being, you know, a dual tower design. Although internally it is basically a dual tower design. It just bookends the cooler with fans instead of having one in the middle. What's cool about this, there's a couple things. Forget about the performance for a second. Right. This is the easiest to install cooler I've ever used and has the best fan mounting and adjustment system I've ever seen. So this is kind of a luxury thing because we're talking about a hundred dollar air cool. It's not, it's 99.99. So that's a is pricey there any, air cooler. Yeah. Is there any way to justify <laughs> that? Well, most coolers you buy like the be quiet, dark rock pro four that I re tested for this review. It's a big dual tower, dual fan air cooler. Mm -hmm. It's $89.99. So this is $10 more. The, it still uses these little wire clips to attach the fans to the edge when you get the fan like centered over it. And getting the middle fan in and connected is kind of a pain. And that's just par for the course. It's the same way with Noctua, although Noctua has, I would say, the best little metal clips in the industry. There's still little metal clips. Okay. So this is a sliding <laughs> mechanism or you can have the fans at whatever height you want and just locks in place. And like, oh, I want the fan here. And it just stays there. It's their ratcheting fan system. And then you can slide it all the way off if I didn't have the wires tangled here under my hand. But you can slide it all the way off. And that's the fan removed. And you can put whatever fan you want in this thing. It's just a plastic frame that has a slot beveled into the side of it. And then there's a corresponding metal track for it on the heat sink and then you just slide it back down fans installed so it's super easy to move the fans around accommodate taller memory modules if you have them and then the top which looks like you know like milled aluminum it's actually just a cap so that comes off and you can see the sort of dual tower nature of this because there's a big cavity in the middle here it kind of looks like a toaster slot and I estimate you could fit one half of a bagel in here, which I did not try. I should have. The review really should have been, can it toast a bagel? I could have put like an Eggo waffle in there. It seems pretty much ideal for Eggo waffles, by the way. Uh, but what's interesting is the, the cavity here leads directly down to the two mounting screws. And this is, this is very much a Noctua style. If you've ever used a Noctua cooler, it has these brackets that kind of are on both sides of the the bottom, the, the cold plate. And then it has these spring-loaded screws on both sides. And you set it down and you reach your screwdriver through and you tighten it on both sides and you're done. So very, very simple. And the, the mounting mechanism, I have it right here. This frame is that same kind of Noctua style where it's a metal back plate. And these two metal brackets on top and they screw down and you have these four posts. Uh, it, it's it's literally just like Noctua. And it, it seems to be strong enough to keep this 3.2 pound cooler from damaging anything. When it's mounted up, it doesn't really want to move around. I don't feel like it's making my motherboard sag. Although I will say... I would feel a little concerned about using this 24-7 with a budget motherboard. But I don't think you're you're probably buying a $100 air cooler to use on a budget motherboard. And more expensive motherboards tend to have more layers. 
So don't use this on a four layer cheap right. PCB motherboard because it's going to make it flex. I don't care how metal the back plate is. So, and of course, I do all my testing on an open test bench, so it was horizontal. So, hey, no, no problems there. But really, if I had this inside of a case, I'd be a little concerned about using a cheap motherboard. But anyway, enough about the design. It is a very effective cooler with, there's an asterisk, because out of the box, if you just plug it in, even though this is a Corsair product, and we're used to Corsair products being Corsair software enabled, like their IQ software and having a USB port somewhere on it and RGB lighting, none of that. This has no lighting. It's the first Corsair product I've looked at in the last year or two with no lighting at all, which is very strange. No IQ compatibility. So it's just two PWM fans. And they spin up to 2,400 RPM, which is very high for a large uh, air cooler these days. Typically, we see like 900 to 1,200 RPM, somewhere in there. Low RPM, low noise, let the heat sink do the work. And this, if you leave it alone, and I was just using a standard motherboard fan profile with all this testing, this performed literally to the tenth of a degree identically to a Noctua NHD14, which was their big legendary cooler from a decade ago that I still use. And I don't have a D15 here to test, sorry. But exactly the same, like to the point where it seemed like it was a mistake and I re-ran the testing because that's what I love to do is retest things to try to invalidate my own result. <laughs> and within like two-tenths of a degree, it was exactly the same. So I just left it. So the same performance as a D14, but significantly higher noise levels. We're talking GPU level noise uh, here. So if you leave it at like just default motherboard settings, if the motherboard fan speeds wants to want to ramp up after a certain point, and I, I, I gave it a worst case scenario, to be fair. I gave it a 9900KS. That's the Core i9 that's pre-overclocked to 5 gigahertz on all cores. And then I was running Cinebench all cores and... Then I did a Blender, the latest version of Blender with the classroom render test, CPU cycles render test, which takes about eight minutes, even with a five gigahertz overclocked eight core 16 thread processor. And over the course of that eight minutes after warming up the CPU, we were getting pretty toasty, but this was still keeping the CPU down below about 90 degrees, all like max package temperature, which in the room was, you know, after I factored in room temperature and we got our delta numbers, we're talking high 60s into low 70s for the loads I was seeing. And that's that's fine. It's still high, but it's fine for 9900KS under load because this can dissipate up to 250 watts. And while the TDP of a Core i9-9900KS is rather hilariously low, when it's actually under full load, the system from the wall is still pulling nearly 290 watts. So it, it's hot. And this did a very good job of coping with that. Like I said, unfortunately, it was doing it at 48.4 decibels at 2400 RPMs. So when I manually adjusted the fan curves, it got significantly quieter immediately. I didn't do every possible percentage, but I did 50, 60, and 70% fans and then compared it against the standard 100% fan result. And temperatures went up slightly, but they went up like a degree which with each change. So I, the 50% fans result was like four or five degrees warmer, but it was the quietest cooler of the group at 50%. It was like 34 and a half decibels. So quieter than a Be Quiet Dark Rock Pro 4, quieter than an HD 14, and quieter than the newer Cooler Master Black Edition, which is, none of these are loud coolers, but the right. the result was very, very quiet. So you could, you could figure out a nice trade-off between noise levels and thermals with this thing, but still, it's a big ask to say, all right, you can, you can play with like trade-offs between noise and thermals with this, but it's $100, and you could spend less money and get one that has better thermals and lower noise with the Be Quiet Dark Rock Pro 4, which is $10 less and had the lowest 
temperatures of the group by about a degree and was also the quietest out of the box. So it's one of those things like how how cool do you think the fan adjustment thing is? Do you do you think it's worth it for the ease of installation if you're only going to install it once? So for someone like me who reviews processors and constantly rebenchmarks processors, I could easily adopt this as my standard test bench like CPU cooler because it's so easy to take off and put back on. But for the average consumer, I find it really hard to justify $100 when unless you're using a processor like the 9900KS, you probably don't need this much cooling potential and can go with something a lot smaller and cheaper like the Cooler Master stuff. And I, I like Corsair. I just I wish this was like $10 less or maybe came with some quieter fans or do what Noctua does and what they used to do anyway because they I think a lot of their stuff now uses PWM fans. But if you remember, a lot of the stuff came with low noise adapters, which would automatically limit the fan RPMs to make it quieter. And you could pick... Do I use a low noise adapter and have like two degrees warmer temps or do I not use it and have louder noise? So something like that would be ni- a nice addition to a product like this where it's like, hey, 2400 RPMs is a lot of cooling potential. How about 1200 RPMs? And it's one of the quietest coolers you can buy. So otherwise, hey, it's a return otherwise. after 10 years <laughs> to the air cooler market. It's still weird to me that this is a Corsair product. Because I just don't think of them when I think about air cooling. There you have it. If you've been frustrated with Noctua's tradition of using brown plastics and beige plastics and nothing else, then you will be delighted if you're building a low-profile AMD system by the new NHLNA AM4 Chromax black CPU cooler, which looks a lot like the NHLNA AM4 uh, in the regular chrome and brown, except, of course, if you're watching the video, you can see that this one is all black all the time. Actually, I have a case this would look really nice inside of. Uh, it is 3800X ready, which means you should still buy a 3700 instead of a 3800X, although I suppose a 3800X is better than a 3800, but we won't get into that conversation right now. Uh, I still want a low-profile 3900 series cooler but uh, for the vast majority of what people might put into a tiny, 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 tiny case, this is going to take care of your cooling problems. That is available now, and it is, oddly enough, $10 more than the version that is multiple shades of brown and chrome. But uh, hey, look, you're paying for that black <laughs> paint or whatever kind of thermal dip or powder coating they're doing with that. It looks cool, though. It's all, for our audio listeners, cool. it's a black it's like, heat sink with black hardware. It looks like something they pried off of the corner of... Darth Vader's chest pack, <laughs> but not but not shiny like Vader's chest pack. It's like the oh matte version of Darth Vader's chest pack. There's uh, something really odd uh, that I admire. Tim Barry wrote this up on the PCPer.com website. By the way, Sebastian Peak, editor in chief PCPer. In case you didn't know, uh, Asus has uh, ROG. It's a bezel-free kit for multi-monitor setups. And I was yes. thinking like, oh, cool, minimal monitor, minimal bezel monitors for your desktop. And it turns out, this is crazy. Um, these are basically two giant plastic, um, uh, uh, there's a word here that belongs to that shape, um, you know, prisms, essentially two plastic prisms and some mounting devices that strap to the top and bottom of the bezels of the cases as they come together and they bend light to hide the bezels which leads to some dim spots approximately one third of the way to the left and right as you pan across your giant collection of pixels um but uh, for 109 dollars, if you have compatible monitors i'm sure it's worth a try um i thought it was kind of fascinatingly odd I was hoping for something like really narrow bezels, but this is a completely different, uh, we'll use the marketing term, solution to that problem. Um, it is out there. Uh, the other thing that was kind of crazy and exciting this week was Motorola Razor pre-orders started $1,500, currently shipping 225.20 from Verizon, i.e. the tail end of February. Uh, the date kind of keeps shipping, although this particular date may be based on the pre-orders have already taken place. Um, the Verge got deep into a video that uh, 
that uh, Motorola posted on, um, well, it's the Caring for Razor video. Uh-oh. Uh, the screen is made to bend. Bumps and lumps are normal. And uh, the video reminds you to close the phone before putting it in a pocket or purse and don't yeah. use a screen yeah, please, protector. Please, please, the only <laughs> possible way to justify this design, use it that way. Yeah. <laughs> Like, so, uh, you, know, you know, we we engineered this to be a folding phone. Please fold it, because if you don't, it'll break, it. and it'll be a waste of your money to not fold your folding phone. I love that they're all like, don't use a screen protector. Um, the Guardian's got an update on the whole Huawei situation. Last we spoke, uh, representatives from the U.S. Department of State were rushing to the UK to make sure Boris didn't let the dreaded Huawei in. Uh, they came up with a compromise, I think, mostly to get the you know, diplomatic representation, the State Department off their butts. Um, they have designated, quote, the, well, uh, they have designated the Chinese technology firm a high-risk vendor and, quote, and imposed a cap on its involvement in building the UK's 5G telecoms network, which is actually the end of the quote. Um, essentially, they're going to cap Huawei's involvement at 35% of their 5G rollouts across Britain's four mobile phone carriers. And uh, they're not going to put any Huawei stuff in critical parts of the network. Uh, no sensitive sites also, including nuclear and military facilities, which is cheerfully disturbing when you start to think about what that means. Um, that's all I got. <laughs> We got an email from Matt who emailed Twitch at Twitch.tv with some thoughts at 1080p Gaming. He writes, hello, over the past year or so, I've basically stopped following all hardware stuff except Paul's hardware because Paul's just about the nicest person on YouTube and you folks. So you and he are my hardware news every week. He says thank you, and we want to say thank you, and thank you for giving us a heads up on Paul's hardware on the YouTubes. Matt says, now you lament that 1080p gaming is still so prolific, but show me the cheapest 27-inch 1440p flat IPS panel at 120 megahertz plus with any HDR. I haven't found one for less than about $500, and that was on sale during the holidays. Maybe that's a lot of criteria, but I also want a monitor that's not going to be put to pasture in a year or two when all of those features become cheaper and more standardized. I don't really need great response time so much as I don't, since I don't play online, but it's still not impossible to find something like that. Hopefully prices come down in the relatively near future. I am waiting with bated breath, Matt in Mesa, Arizona. So, and he brings up a really good point. Um, there are 120 megahertz uh, or 120 megahertz plus 1440 uh, IPS panels um, that are relatively inexpensive and should last a long time. The whole HDR question is going to take a couple years to evolve at this point um, because, because, one, there's just now sort of decent basis standards for those. Most of the monitors uh, are actually catching up quickly from the major manufacturers because um, we were looking at numbers in 2019 where they were essentially giving higher NIT ratings, legit NIT ratings, than, say, 2018's high-end televisions in terms of HDR performance. But HDR is a kind of moving target, and the longer you can wait if you want HDR compatibility and the brighter the screen you get, or if magically a, a top-quality OLED panel starts showing up on desktop monitors, that would be the way to go. Uh, HDR performance is going to be problematic, I think, on most desktop monitors, dot, dot, dot. I could also say... Given how the games industry moves, I wouldn't really push too hard for HDR on my gaming desktop. But I also may be um, just cynical <laughs> about that at this point. So, but HDR makes everything better. Well, I said slightly sarcastically. No, I, <laughs> I, my personal feeling about HDR is probably different than most. I really could not care less about the overall brightness. Everybody talks right. about brightness it seems when we talk about hdr like what are the the peak nits what about total screen brightness what about right. the duration of that and really for me a tv that even gets up to 500 nits is crazy bright in a dark room because yeah. i'm the weirdo who thinks that you need a dark room to watch a movie because it makes it more <laughs> a little bias light. lighting behind your screen would not hurt you <laughs> no it wouldn't and there's always a there's a bias light somewhere like if i have the light in the other room on that's enough right. of a bias light for me but the living room is always dark when I watch a movie. And anything over like 100 nits is probably going to sear my eyeballs when, once I get relaxed into that dark environment. And then something bright comes on the screen. For me, wow. the, the bigger thing about HDR is a standard for better black levels. 
higher contrast yes, between those. Yes, it's called bars. OLED. <laughs> yeah, I mean, well, that, there's there's, and, there's two ways. Well, the, okay, so like Robert and I were looking at a television a couple years ago at CES from Sony that was literally like a ten thousand nit television, which is sort of the ultimate in in dealing with having bright levels that compensate for for yeah. non OLED black levels on screens. Uh, if you want the gold standard for black levels, which re- you know require the least amount of brightness over the black level to give you that experience, then you want an OLED, which when you turn off the pixel goes completely black. Um, and that's and then that's the problem is right now you have OLED uh, or you try to use brightness levels that make uh, colors seem bright enough that gray seems black by comparison. I will suggest that you may be on sort of the far end of the bell curve for being frustrated by brightness and a little bias lighting around the back of your screen might be helpful. But I'm not getting into an argument with that because you know what you like and it's your living room and you can enjoy the snot out of it. Uh, you know, it's I, I think if if projectors went really, really far the other way with brightness, like yeah. is, the, the black level with a projector is really never going to match what you can do with yeah. local dimming on a LCD screen or with OLED. True. But the biggest problem with projectors and the projector lifestyle is that it's just it never seems to be bright enough depending on how bright your room is during the brightest part of the day it can be even with a brighter projector you can see almost nothing on the screen and people do things like buy these high gain screen and obviously this is more your area of expertise and roberts too (laughs) but people can they can look at different screen materials and say well this one has a gain of this versus that well you don't really want a ton of gain on your screen because that creates other issues um yeah, I mean, and some people do negative gain because they want to make their right. black levels as good as possible. So it's screen <sighs> material I mean, is the, a big trade-off. Environment is everything with projection. Yeah, but I mean, it, I will also say that that you know, in in the last few years, projector brightness has taken huge leaps, and also I I think being honest in measuring projector brightness has taken huge leaps in the industry because um, it. it, it at least at the high end, when you're, you know, sort of shopping third or fourth tier brands on Amazon, the claims are pretty hysterical. You know, where maybe yeah. they're measuring their brightness levels four inches from the lens or at the lens or maybe at the lamp. Um, <laughs> and, and than, the, by and the way, the in the same way as they are sort of being generous about the actual resolution of the projector itself, like, oh, it's 1080p. Yeah. I mean, it's really 1280 uh, by 640 right. blown up. But it's 1080p, sort of, with interpolation. Well, when you're looking at the at, at the major manufacturers, you know, Epson comes to mind. They Epson probably sells 60% of, of the projectors in the United States right now. Um, what I affectionately call faux K, F A U X K. Their 4K, as of the last iteration, is indistinguishable in performance from a, a true 4K projector. Um, again, when you get into fourth tier brands you've never heard of selling for Amazon, the your mileage is going to vary a lot. And if they didn't, you know, do some work on uh, <laughs> on on the stuff that happens to the pixels before they get pumped out through the LED, uh, your video experience is going to suffer. So um so Ring has been a sponsor of Twitch for quite a bit in the past, uh, but we want to call up uh, uh, some of the stuff that's been going on because I, I had been asked about this and uh, I wanted to talk about it on the show. Um, you know, so the Red Street UK wrote a pretty brutal article called Ding Dong, Who's There? Any marketing outfit willing to pay, not content with giving cops access to doorbell cams. Ring also touts personal info. And my first thought was this is in some ways kind of an exaggeration, um, you know, there's no doubt, uh, you know, the, the, the EFF, the Electronic Frontier Foundation, um, did some pretty intense study of the Android app uh, and found that there were third-party trackers in there, some of which Ring claims are, you know, uh, contractors they essentially use to evaluate the performance of the application. In other cases, they are absolutely selling uh, your information to marketing organizations. Um, it's frustrating, right? Uh, you know, as, as the EFF says, you know, the danger in sending even small bits of information is that analytics and tracking companies are able to combine these bits together to form a unique picture of the user's device. This cohesive whole represents a fingerprint that follows the user as they interact with other apps and use the device, in essence, providing trackers the ability to spy on what a user is doing in their digital lives when and when they are doing it. 
uh, and possibly even the, you know the register claims uh, that you know these these third parties can uh, quote to build a comprehensive, constantly updated profile of what you are doing and where you are at giving any time, uh, which you can then compile and sell. Um, you know, there's no doubt it, the register acknowledges that that this data is made available to third parties. Um, you know, the wire cutter did uh, some really solid investigation in an article uh, write up they called Ring Neighbors is the best and worst neighborhood watch app. And this is where the the sort of police reference is going in. Um, quote, no one at Ring or nor any police department is allowed to access Ring videos or personal information unless device owners choose to share them via neighbors. And even if you do post a video to the neighbors app, your identity and your contact information remain anonymous. Um, and this is because, uh, you know, neighbors is the idea that you can share your videos or be like, look, this guy came up on my porch. Beware. And, you know, the the kind of in, in some levels you can be like, OK, I could share this with the police or I could share this with my neighbors or, you know, you can automatically share this information with whoever you choose to. Um, but uh, the Boston Magazine um, you know, the, the had a really good write up um, on their technology. Uh, Spencer Buell wrote this up for them uh, literally a few days ago, or a couple, three days ago this week. Uh, Ring's neighborhood watch feature is bringing out the worst in Boston. Uh, you know, because one of the things about Ring is they, they tend to, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of good things about Ring. You know, you can verify whether packages have gotten there, you can find out who's at the door before you open it. Um, but what is kind of crazy is that it also means relatively innocent stuff can be categorized as threatening. And, um, you know, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, as, as, uh, Mr. Buell writes, um, in the year and a half since, uh, referring to the rollout of neighbors, uh, local users haven't just been uploading videos of crimes in action. They've been using the app to post just about anything that seems mysterious or untoward. In other words, the app has become a cesspool of paranoia and aggression, where even looking suspicion is grounds for inclusion on the app's ceaseless stream of updates. So, <laughs> scrolling through neighbors recently, I found a video of a man in Winthrop ducking under an awning to escape the rain, ominously described as someone lurking on front porch. <laughs> it's like uh, a new art drivers. Form. Yeah. Yeah, delivery drivers and city workers captured on ring cameras who are flying to potential robbers and scammers. Um, you know, it's you know, it, it's it. People get paranoid. Uh, people are paranoid. Um, you know, and this tends to bring out some of the less uh, uh, less desirable aspects of of a surveillance, a DIY. Let's all volunteer to become members of a surveillance society to make everything safer. Um, I mean, this kind of ties into something that, that Leo and I uh, and the rest of the crew were talking about a twit a couple of weeks ago. Um, you know, like it's, it's what this technology does is really based on what people do with it. Uh, personally, from my point of view, trading a little uh, a little freedom for a little security is always kind of an iffy proposition. Um, because the security tends not to be as secure as you think it is. Uh, but just be aware of, of your options and how you participate uh, in the surveillance society that seems to be becoming pretty normal across most of the world. Uh, it, it's amazing. If you if you haven't been paying attention to how many cameras there are and where they are, you might want to start looking around you uh, when you're in public places and public streets. They are everywhere. And uh, it's a little unnerving sometimes. I know. If I wasn't doing anything wrong, what should I be paranoid about? Right, exactly. <laughs> what are you trying to hide, Patrick? Ah. Hey, you know what? Uh, you know, it's, it's uh, uh, you know, Ryan Trout loves his ring doorbells. Uh, you know, they help him deal with packages. They help him deal with, you know, strangers knocking at the door. Um, it's legit. And they it's also legit. control it gets every kind of aspect of his life. So Ryan, I don't it, think it, it quite got to that point. I, I think, think it did. I think his his it. ring doorbell started suggesting things to him, like you don't want to keep doing this to you. You know, Intel's a big company. <laughs> Maybe they have some jobs available. And then it just it got in here, and he just he couldn't let it go. And it wasn't just a voice in his head; it was literally his ring doorbell just 
suggested for any legal representatives of for anyone who might work <laughs> on the legal side of ring or intel that is meant to be a humorous aside and a comment on our relationship to mr shrout and how much me was working with him uh, on the same side of the media fence and look at him look at him with his microphone <laughs> thing he looks like a motivational speaker Oh, my goodness. Hey, if you're thinking about starting a business, uh, it's probably too late, but you never know. Um, there's a great article uh, on The Verge. Uh, and <laughs> I love that. <laughs> my wife uh, who was walking if by. If you're thinking about starting a business, yeah, it's going to fail. But, hey, there's a great article no, 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 on no, no, The Verge. No, no, that's, that's not what I meant. Um, okay, no, this okay. Is, this, is, this is That just came out completely wrong, <laughs> even by uh, our somewhat loose standards. Um the article is the Twitch streamer behind Tfue's custom $3,500 mechanical keyboard. Uh -huh. uh, and it's about custom keyboard manufacturing. Uh, Nick Stat did the write-up for The Verge. Um, but uh, Teha Kim uh, started making mechanical keyboards on Twitch. Uh, you know, he's... Uh, this is... The, one, the keyboards are beautiful. Uh, and two... Uh, well, it better the, uh, be. Teha Ta well, yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> He's sourcing rare and limited run components from across the globe. The website is tehatypes.com. And uh, I, uh, you know, every time I think I've seen all of the crazed high end keyboard options out there, it turns out there's whole new levels of joy and madness. I also feel like uh, there's a lot of drop.com quality time spent finding some of the manufacturers of some of the more sophisticated uh, keys out there. If you've never spent time looking at custom keycap sets on on Dropbox or Drop.com, it's mind blowing and slightly unhinged. So there is something to so be pretty. said for uh, limitation. Like limitation is good because you get into these realms. <laughs> like, oh, I could build a custom keyboard. That's cool. So what are my options for keycaps? I'm going to need those. And there's like a hundred thousand. And there's all these different materials. And it's your mind explodes, but I well, I would still do that before I would spend thirty five hundred dollars on a keyboard. Just me, yeah, probably spend. I would spend five hundred dollars on a keyboard if you gave me three thousand dollars cash to go put together a PC with. How about that? Well, you know, given the the rumors about some of the money that's being laid in front of Twitch streamers to move yeah. them on to you know competitive platforms from YouTube or Microsoft, they may have some money to spend. And why sure. not do it on something you use every day to make your living, like your keyboard? So, anyhow, uh, Teha Types is the website. They're beautiful. There's some interesting stuff up there if you want to check it out. And, uh, you know, probably not too late to start a business, but it's fun to see <laughs> Oh, how. yeah. Yeah, well, I like how you book into that a sentence. <laughs> if you're over 40, it's not too late to start a business. Patrick Norton shows you how. <laughs> There's an ebook I can sell on my email yeah. list managed. Oh, boy. So, <laughs> so much weirdness in the universe. With that, ladies and gentlemen, this week in computer hardware should probably draw rapidly to a close. We call it Twitch. We being Sebastian Peak, editor chief of PCPer.com, I'm Patrick Norton. And that's the website, twit.tv slash twitch, where you can get all the information on how to subscribe, links to subscribe, and of course, watch, stream, or preferably subscribe to get all of our older episodes. And if you're a subscriber, all of our new episodes in whatever format makes you happiest. As I mentioned just a moment ago, Sebastian Peake is editor-in-chief of PCPer.com. He writes and benchmarks and keeps that place rolling. And you can find more of me at avxcel.com. we got a new episode coming out later this week. Can we plan to resume normal broadcasting or recording on uh, AVXL in February? Because it's time, people. With that, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for listening to This Week in Computer Hardware. Do us a favor, send us an email, twitch at twit.tv. Tell us what you think about in the hardware universe, and we will talk about it or answer your questions or speculate with you. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, I'm Patrick Norton. And I am Sebastian Peake. Catch you next week on Twitch.